This is Thanksgiving week across Canada. Families gather at mealtime and they're grateful to be together and they're thankful for God's bounty. However, at that table is often an uninvited guest. That's what I want to talk about today. His name is Anger. Anger can divide a marriage and it can divide families. Anger can also divide churches and it divides nations. And angry people are unpredictable. Do you have a short fuse? Do you get ticked off easily? Behavioral science. They say that a person who is angry and out of control can often be a person who is temporarily insane. It can be that bad. Anger has all kinds of faces. Maybe it's something that irritates you. It could be somebody who repeatedly gets under your skin. It could be your vocabulary. You blurt out a statement that you wish you hadn't said. Maybe you're insecure and your only defense is your bad temper. Maybe you're a bit of a perfectionist. If things don't go your way, maybe your temper boils over and you result in some really hostile actions. Do you know what's strange about anger? You can't hide it. It's written all over your face. It shows up in your eyes. It shows up in your words. And it shows up in your body when you, with your body language, speak volumes. You walk faster. Your gestures are exaggerated. Sometimes you're a stoic. You say nothing. But your silence is deafening. In other words, your behavior is on public display and there are always witnesses. If that's true, then what would you say is the opposite? It's called self-control. David, whom we're studying, is going to be king. He's a fugitive right now, he's in hiding, and a large number of fighting men have joined him, over 600. The Bible has stated that God chose him because he was a man after God's own heart. Well, he shouldn't get angry then, should he, with that a reputation? David's name is mentioned more in the New Testament than any other Old Testament character. Well, I thought patience then was his watchword. Shepherd boy, alone in the hills, forging a quiet spirit as a farm boy, living in the palace with Saul. He portrayed lots of self-control, even when Saul tried to kill him with a spear. But this lesson is about an incident that David finds himself in. And in that incident, he's going to lose control He's going to get angry. It's going to boil over. And he's about to do something that he's going to be ashamed of all the days of his life. But something is going to happen in our story that's going to keep him from being a murderer. What stopped David can stop you if you're angry. And what changed his heart can change yours if you're just like him. He's going to meet somebody he's never met before. It's the most unlikely source and it's going to change his mind. Here's the setting. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 25. The district we're talking about is Peran on the Jewish border between Syria and their country. David has 600 guerrilla fighters 
He's hiding out and he's been fighting enemy tribes in the wilderness. And these enemies, they would overrun an area, they would swipe livestock, kidnap the young maidens, and they would even attack the small villages. David and his band of warriors, they were the RCMP officers watching out for the farmers when they were asleep. Wealthy landowners, during the sheep shearing, which this is, they would reward men like David for their kindness in keeping watch. And they would even feed them. They'd invite them in for their celebration, kind of like a Thanksgiving feast, and give them a word of thanks for what they did. David is running out of food. He's got all these men, all in camp. He picks 10 of them as ambassadors to go and visit a wealthy farmer in the neighborhood and he's going to ask that farmer for a favor. Since he's been protecting this farmer and his sheep and his livestock, he's going to ask him if he couldn't spare maybe a couple of sheep and three or four goats for David to bring home and have a barbecue with his trusty men. Sort of a festival meal to celebrate the bountiful harvest and that abundant crop of wool that this wealthy man is going to soon have. Here's how these 10 men were treated. When they asked the wealthy farm man, owner, if they could maybe just have a few groceries. Here's what he said to them. First Samuel 25, beginning at verse 12. Get lost. The country is full of beggars like you. Do you think I'm going to take good bread and good wine and meat that's freshly butchered and give it to men that I've never seen or laid eyes on? Beat it. Go beg from somebody else. You're not going to get anything from me. Go. Get out of here. When the men told this to David when they got back at camp, David hit the roof. So did his anger. He said to his stormtroopers, Men, you're going to witness a murder. Strap on your swords. I want 400 of you to follow me. 200 of you, you stay back and keep an eye on the camp when we're gone. Back on the farm, In the kitchen, the wealthy farmer's wife, she was told by one of the shepherds what her husband said to David's men. She also knew that David's men, they had formed a wall around the farm, protecting them day and night from any sheep marauders. And they were like volunteer night watchmen. The shepherd, bringing the news, said to the lady of the house, you had better do something and you better do it quickly. I think those men, they were highly insulted by your husband and they're going to come back and they're going to get even and all of us are in trouble. Well, hearing that, that lady of the house, she flew into action. Everybody in the kitchen put on an apron and they all rolled up their sleeves. She made 200 loaves of bread. She poured four gallons of wine. Five sheep were fully dressed. A bushel of roasted nuts was in order, 100 raisin cakes, 200 fig cakes, and four or five of the servants went out to the stables to get the carts and the horses and the donkeys. Nobody told her husband. The whole kitchen crew and the slaves, they snuck out the back door when everything was in place and they headed down the road. 
carts and donkeys laden with food to head off a tragedy in the making. It's now that my lesson begins to make sense. David, he's hell-bent on revenge. His anger is spilling over. This farm wife, she's going to try and head him off and maybe, well now just maybe, save the life of her husband. David's kindness has been repaid with insults. David's anger is going to get even. He's going to slaughter not only this woman's husband, he's out to slaughter everybody in his whole household. Now that's going to be a bloodbath. By now, you've probably figured out who the leading characters are in this story. Nabal, he's the wealthy landlord. He's greedy and he's highly insulting. Abigail, she's the wife in the kitchen. She's the vessel of kindness. She's the vessel of understanding and she's very beautiful. And her appearance is not just on the outside but it's also on the inside as a person. David, he's the anointed newly crowned king. But he's about to do something really stupid. That if he carries it out, it's going to affect him for a long, long time. Watch Abigail. She's riding her donkey. She's descending into the ravine. All her servants are in tow. All those animals are loaded to the hilt with supplies. David and his men, they're descending from the other end and they're going to meet in the middle. Abigail knows what she's facing. She has lived with an abuse back home with a man totally out of control for her entire marriage. She's put up with an impossible man. How is she going to approach David? How is she going to make him change his mind? Well, three things are going to happen. And those three things I want to teach you because that's what she did. And she's going to handle David. And David's really a bit of a madman at this point. Here are three lessons that we're going to learn from this lady. One, she wants you to be full of wisdom. She wants you to use your head. Two, she's full of tact. She wants you to trust your instincts, your common sense. Three, this girl is full of feelings. She doesn't want to hold anything back. Don't hide a thing. Here's her first lesson. She's full of wisdom. She used her head. She gets off her donkey. She falls on her face to the ground right in front of David. And six times in this chapter, she calls herself, I'm your maidservant. That's all I am, is the word slave. I'm your slave. Here's the second thing she says. Eight times, she addresses David as my Lord. She treats him as a ruler. Listen to her opening words, verse 23 of 1 Samuel 25. My Lord, let me take the blame. My husband's a fool. Stupidity just oozes from out of him. Please listen to me, don't listen to him. She knew how evil her husband was. Please, my lord, don't pay attention to this worthless man. She didn't cover up his actions. She didn't excuse his behavior. She takes the full responsibility on herself. Blame me, my lord. Please blame me. Please let me be the mediator between you, my lord, and my wicked husband. And if you're going to blame anybody and kill anybody, make it me, my lord. 
She goes on. In verse 25, as God lives, my Lord, God has kept you from avenging murder. Now take these gifts that I have for you, and may your young men follow in the steps of my master. There's the first lesson. When you're dealing with anger, you take the blame. That's wisdom. Jesus became sin for us. He took the blame and he wants you to do the very same. Here comes the second lesson. This lady was full of tact. She uses her instinct. In her heart, Abigail knew that David would be king of Israel one day. She says to him, don't avenge your anger by killing my husband. If you do, you'll have on your conscience all the days of your life. Don't ruin your kingship by doing this act of murder, even though you've been deeply hurt. She was trusting David to somehow change his mind. In essence, she looks at David, being the next king, don't let your record as a king be marred with murder. You've been wronged, but taking a man's life in payment isn't going to be the answer. Please accept this food. Turn around and go back. Trust me, that's the right thing to do. That's your second lesson. This lady was full of tact. Are you tactful? Boy, sometimes I'm not. I can be very ashamed for what comes out of my mouth. Now comes the third lesson. If you want to overcome anger, try this. Don't hide your feelings. Let them all out. Don't hide anything and don't keep anything back. Abigail, she finishes preaching to David a little sermon. I wish I could preach a sermon as good as this. I never did in my lifetime. Verse 30 of chapter 25 of 1 Samuel. It's not long. It's only two sentences. But man, is it ever loaded. Here's what it says. It's going to come about that God is going to appoint you ruler over Israel. Don't let grief and don't let a troubled heart make you shed blood without cause. And don't ruin the good that has been spoken of you. Wow. Wish I could say that. In other words, don't let grief or a troubled heart ruin you. You've proven to the people that you've got a good reputation. Don't throw it away. Uh, you have a wonderful track record. You'll need every bit of that as a king. God wants you to be first the king of your own life, and then from there, you go out and be their king. Don't let your grief and your troubled heart make you stumble. Your people know what a wonderful reputation you have. Keep it. Don't throw it away. A good track record is going to continue to serve you well if you do. I like her closing line to David. It's cute. Verse 31, First Samuel 25. When the Lord shall deal well with you, my Lord, will you remember what I said? I'm just your maidservant. In other words, what I've been telling you has come right from the heart. I don't have anything more I can say to you. Now you be David. You never met this lady before. You're down there in the valley. She came down that hill. You came down that hill. She's standing in front of you. David's anger and his adrenaline has suddenly stopped flowing. Your heart isn't racing now like it was before. You seem to have regained your senses. You become quiet again. You've cleared your head. He just heard a complete stranger put him back on his feet. His purpose for living just got cleared up. 
His good track record wasn't compromised, and a crisis has now been averted. Verse 32, 1 Samuel 24, the Bible says so much in just a few words. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. That word blessed, if you translated it into our language, is the word wow. Blessed. Blessed, wow, is the God of Israel who sent you here to show up so I can change my mind. When he said that, he probably had his hand beside him on the sword, ready to pull it out and unsheath it and go and use it on her husband. The blind spot in his life had suddenly received light. And he says, I have listened to you and I grant to you your request. I'm going to take my men and I'm now going to go back to camp. Have you ever heard of Giuseppe Verdi? Let me tell you who he was. He was born October the 9th, 1813. It was a little Italian hamlet called La Roncale. He arrived on the bitter soil of poverty and his country was in political oppression. As Giuseppe grew up, he had no idea what he wanted to be. At age seven, his mother took him to visit the great cathedral, which was a border city to his little hamlet. He had never been outside his village before. Looking at those stained glass windows, those massive high sanctuary, high altar, beautiful marble carvings of the apostles, Giuseppe just stared in disbelief. He walked up the steps and he stood quietly beside the communion table and he didn't move. He had never been in such a holy place in all his life. Suddenly, the cathedral pipe organ began to play. He was so deeply affected by that music that he froze on the spot. He couldn't even move. It was as if he was on the edge of the step and in a trance. He doesn't remember how long he stood there, but one of the priests there on the stage, he got angry. He watched this little seven-year-old boy standing, saying nothing. He's a bit of an embarrassment if anybody would buy to see it. Do you know what he did? He violently shoved him down the tumbling steps of that altar and he fell on the floor. Giuseppe, he looked back and he could see the smirk on the face of that priest and he said, I'm gonna make you pay for this. He went home. He told his father what had happened. And then further, he said to his dad, Dad, I heard the most beautiful music from that pipe organ. Now I know what I want to be. I want to be a musician. Do you think I could take lessons? Well, his father said to him, we're poor. We have no money for lessons. Giuseppe said, but dad, you're a laborer. You can do all kinds of things. If I get a musician who will teach me lessons, maybe you could do some jobs for him in payment so we'd both be equal. His dad thought, maybe that'll work. Sure enough, he got a musician and he got many musicians. And his dad did exactly what he'd asked. He did the jobs, so did the musicians. They did their job. They taught this young boy music. 30 years. He is now of age. His country, Italy, is engaged in a bitter struggle for independence from France and Austria. Verdi is now an accomplished musician and a composer. 
He's been working on an opera called the Nibaco. It's the biblical story of the Jerusalem conquest of Babylon. And it was almost a direct likeness to what was going on at that moment within Italy. In the third act of the opera, the Israelites, they sing a beautiful song in exile. It's been called the Hebrew Slave Chorus. Go, my thoughts on golden wings. Greet the river Jordan, Zion's ruined towers, and on it goes. Verdi composed that music with a broken heart. He had just lost his two daughters, and now he had just lost his wife. He really didn't want to go on. He thought, I've lost them, I might as well go too. His opera called the Regaletti was almost complete, however. And then he thought, well, if I play it, and I play it, and I write it, and they hear it, what if nobody likes it? What if I'm treated just like I was by that priest? They're going to throw me down off the stage. He finished the music, and an opera house was prepared. The musicians were brought forth, and a huge orchestra was in place. So was a large chorus. The Regaletti was about to be performed to a full house of wandering Italians concerned about the unification of their nation. And would they also be exiles like the Hebrews in that opera? Nervous and full of fear, Giuseppe, he lifted the baton and the orchestra began to play. The opera house was packed. Every seat was full. But everybody sat on the edge of their seat. And when the music got to that part where the full choir began to repeat the refrain of the Hebrew slave chorus, go my thoughts on golden wings. Well, the effect on the audience was electric. Cheers lifted the roof of the La Scala Opera House. And Verdi, thinking he was gonna be thrown off the stage, instead, the audience came on stage, put him on his shoulders, and they marched him out the front door of the opera house. And they paraded him all around the opera. And then they brought him back again, right on the stage. And they said, do it again. Well, they played the Hebrew slave chorus once more. And the same thing happened. They come on stage, they put him on their shoulders, only this time they took him to the town square and they paraded all through the village. Do you know what happened as a result of that event down at the Opera House? Verdi became a national hero. Word spread all over Italy what had happened in that little town. Orchestras were struck up, Rome, Venice, all over the country. They wanted to hear it for themselves. And Verdi didn't disappoint them. He gathered and he did. That Hebrew chorus became almost to the Italians the music to God Bless America over here. It unified the entire country. Parnell, one of their great leaders, he took that and made it almost their national anthem. Italy was unified. It became one. That young man's anger at the age of seven, being pushed down the stairs by, of all things, a priest in the church. He got even. He wrote an opera, and he unified the entire nation. What happened to David? Almost the same thing. Abigail took a man who was hell-bent on destroying her family, changed his mind, and he became the greatest king that Israel ever had, unifying both the north and the south. What about you? You heard the story. You've dealt with anger. Do you think it could happen to you? Even at a Thanksgiving dinner, if people are angry, you can change it. You take the blame. Watch what happens. Anger is a cocktail and you mix it for the enemy. 
But after you have mixed the cocktail, anger makes you drink it. And when you drink it, you're the loser. Thanks for coming today. I'm glad you came along. I hope anger didn't destroy my talk. Looking into your Thanksgiving. Take it as a victory. Jesus did. He became sin for us. That we who knew new sin would become victors. Isn't that great? See you next time.